The following program is sponsored by CBN. Today. That's when I find out you have cancer. A young singer. I'm just sitting in the chair, weeping as the doctor is just telling me what's going to happen. Makes an amazing comeback. And my first response was, that's not my story. I woke up the next day and I, I started telling myself, I'm not going to give up. On today's 700 Club. I can redeem it. I can bring what was dead back to life. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. President Trump ordered a military strike on Iran last night and then reversed course before any missiles were fired. This comes as tensions are rising between the United States and the Iranian regime and one day after a U.S. surveillance drone was shot down in the Persian Gulf. Mark Martin has the story. With planes in the air and ships in position, President Trump called off the strike targeting radar and missile sites. It's not clear if the president stopped the attacks because he changed his mind or due to logistical and strategic reasons. All of this in response to Iran's downing of a U.S. surveillance drone. They made a very big mistake. Iranian officials say the drone, similar to this one, was hovering in their airspace when they used surface-to-air missiles to shoot it down. But during a Pentagon briefing, the head of the U.S. Air Force Central Command said that's not true. This was an unprovoked attack on a U.S. surveillance asset that had not violated Iranian airspace at any time during its mission. This attack is an attempt to disrupt our ability to monitor the area following recent threats to international shipping and the free flow of commerce. Iran's ambassador to the U.N. tells NPR it tried to contact the drone, but, quote, since it was a spy drone, we were left with no other option. U.S. military leaders say the drone was over the Strait of Hormuz in international airspace. The shootdown follows a string of incidents in recent weeks, including attacks on six commercial ships in the region. Iran suspected in all of them. Word that Iranian proxies were loading missiles onto boats within range of U.S. naval assets and other threats. All in response to U.S.-led sanctions against Iran after the U.S. pulled out of the Iran nuclear deal. Lawmakers are split on what the next move should be. Some urge caution, others just the opposite. We're worried that he and the administration may bumble into a war. The only way Iran changes its behavior is if they believe uh, America will put options on the table that would create pain for the regime. Iran did claim responsibility for shooting down the U.S. drone. The head of the Revolutionary Guard saying the Islamic regime doesn't want armed conflict, but it's ready for war. Meanwhile, the FAA has stopped U.S. commercial air traffic from flying over Iran because of safety concerns. That affects flights over the Persian Gulf and Gulf of Oman. The ban is in effect until further notice. Mark Martin, CBN News. Well, President Trump has said what he wants is talks and, and talks to uh, go back again to the negotiating table to determine what's the future of Iran's nuclear weapons program. But the supreme leader and, it's, you know, the Revolutionary Guard says all decisions are up to him. He's already said he's never going to negotiate with Trump. So here we are in a situation where a, a trigger was pulled and then pulled back. Uh, one thing I know, in the Middle East, you never show weakness. And so if you're going to strike, if you're going to make that decision, then if you don't go through with it, what's the interpretation on the other side? So we've seen a series of provocations. These bombings of tankers are in direct violation of international law, internet, or international trade. Then you shoot down a drone in international airspace, and if there's no retaliation, uh, what's the Iranian regime going to say? Well, well, we can do this, and we can do this with impunity. Are there steps that you can do bef before you get into military conflict? Yes, but when you look at what Israel did when Iran shot a missile at one of their jets, what they did is they went back and bombed that missile site. Uh, can we get into some kind of increased boycott? Can you get into a blockade of their ports, stop all of their oil shipments? Can you make their airspace a no-fly zone and cut off all commercial traffic? All of those things can happen. 
uh, but we're just going to have to stand by and see. This is a hot point right now. And could we stumble into war? The answer is absolutely yes. Uh, and what would happen if we do? Uh, specifically, what could happen to the nation of Israel? The standoff between the U.S. and Iran could have an impact on Israel. And Ephraim Graham has that story from our CBN Newsroom. Gordon, with the talk of possible U.S. military action against Iran, there are concerns Israel might be dragged into the conflict. As CBN Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell explains, that's because one of Israel's biggest threats, Hezbollah in Lebanon, gets its money and marching orders from Iran. Looking at these peaceful hills, it's hard to imagine a well-armed enemy is hidden and possibly waiting to strike. The fact that Hezbollah is involved in every aspect of life of the people in those towns on the other side of the border enables it to deploy such a huge and massive military infrastructure in South Lebanon. We're standing on the Israeli-Lebanese border. Just on the other side, you can see the yellow Hezbollah flags flying. The IDF estimates that Hezbollah has hidden well over 100,000 rockets in these towns and villages in southern Lebanon. All of them comfortably hidden behind Lebanese civilians inside Lebanon. IDF spokesman Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Conrica says that plays into Hezbollah's hands. And the aim of Hezbollah is to be able to have those rockets, fire them at Iranian orders at our civilians, and then once we retaliate, that would cause collateral damage, and they would then try to use that for their advantage. During fighting in 2006, Hezbollah launched some 4,000 rockets at northern Israeli cities. Now, most of Israel is in range of its rockets. Hezbollah is still more armed than many European armies today. And it's financed by Iran. Iranian money has facilitated this, as well as many other hostile, aggressive endeavors that Hezbollah has, whether it is the vast rocket arsenal that Hezbollah has, whether it is trying to convert rockets into accurate missiles, or the tunnel project. CBN News recently got a rare look inside the sixth and largest tunnel Israel has uncovered along its border with Lebanon. You're looking at the equivalent of a 22-story building underground. Had it not been discovered, hundreds of armed Hezbollah fighters could have filled the tunnel, waiting to attack, kidnap, and kill Israelis. Reserve Lieutenant Colonel Sarit Zahavi says there's always a possibility of war. I think it depends on how much pressure will be put on Iran and Hezbollah. It depends, like the leader of Hezbollah said, that if there will be war between Iran and the United States, Israel and Saudi Arabia will be attacked. So will there be a war with Hezbollah? We sure aren't looking for one. But at the end of the day, if the Iranians order Hezbollah to attack Israel, they will be met with a very firm and strong and a painful response by the IDF. For now, Israel and the rest of the Middle East wait to see whether U.S.-Iranian tensions grow or dissipate. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, on the Israeli-Lebanese border. Back here at home, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled a memorial cross not far from the nation's capital can stay on public land. CBN's Abby Robertson reports now from Washington. The Supreme Court issued a big win for religious liberty, ruling 7-2 that the Bladensburg Memorial can stand, a 40-foot cross honoring 49 men from the area lost in World War I. The Supreme Court uh, has sided uh, with reality and sensibility. The legal showdown started when the American Humanist Association challenged that the cross, sitting on public land, violated the separation of church and state. When I heard they wanted to take it down, it just, it struck at my heart, it was terrible. The memorial is in the shape of a cross to mark most graves of the wars fallen across Europe. There's gonna be a presumptive constitutionality for these religious symbols and monuments and memorials and practices across our country. That is a huge, that's a sea change. Kelly Shackelford, chief counsel for the First Liberty Institute, says the legal precedent in the case of the cross was flawed. They said that everything's changing. This 50-year-old precedent, this Lemon case, where separation of church and state and all these concepts that are not in the, con the words of the Constitution were brought up and that led to a lot of hostility by the government to religion. They said, and look, in these cases, Lemon is not going to be applied anymore. 
At stake in the Peace Cross ruling was this dire scenario. If this memorial is able to be destroyed, that means that bulldozer is going to turn from Bladensburg and roll across the, the river over to Arlington National Cemetery, where it will start knocking down the Argonne Cross, the Canadian Cross of Sacrifice, and may even make its way down to, to Teddy and Bobby Kennedy's graves, which themselves have grave markers in the shape of a cross. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, one of two justices who dissented, argues when a cross is on public property, the government may be presumed to endorse its religious content. The founders would be shocked by that idea. We are religious people with a religious heritage. There's a Moses holding the Ten Commandments in the Supreme Court. First Liberty is also celebrating the High Court throwing out an Oregon court's ruling against their clients who refused to bake a cake for a same-sex wedding. Reporting from the Supreme Court, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. The memorial is something certainly those men have earned. Gordon? Well, this is a, in my opinion, a narrow ruling. And essentially what the court has said is if you have an historical monument, and in this case, a monument that's 100 years old, uh, if there's an historical monument, if the government comes in and then tears it down, then that is hostility from the government against religion and would be interpreted by the pop population as hostility to the Christian religion. And so that's why they said, no, the monument has to stand. So there's now an exception if there is an historical monument, uh, if, the, if it's got a long history behind it, uh, then it gets to stand. But there's still an open question if you were to build a new monument to the fallen in a war, uh, what would happen? Uh, would that be considered a, an endorsement of a religion? Let me underline what uh, Justice Ginsburg did. She took the unusual step, and it is unusual, to read her dissent in the open court. Uh, that tells you how much she feels about this. And she, in her dissent, said any cross on public land is an endorsement of religion. And this goes back to the famous Lemon test, Lemon versus Kurtzman. It's back from 1971. In that case out, outlined excessive entanglement, but it has been interpreted by the court uh, subsequently that any endorsement of religion is improper under the First Amendment Establishment Clause. The founders would just turn over in their grave on this interpretation. Uh, the, for them, established religion was state religion, that if you weren't part of the state religion, uh, then then you were considered an outsider in society. Um, that it, they, of course, endorsed religion and, in court, uh, of course, endorsed Christianity. In the Constitution, it's written in the year of our Lord. The Declaration of uh, Independence has an appeal to the sovereign God. Uh, they were a very religious people. And for us to now be hostile to religion, to say we can't ever have a cross, uh, is just uh, just mind-boggling to me. Now, what's going to happen with a new cross that's built? Uh, I'm sitting right now in the city of Virginia Beach. We had a terrible, terrible tragedy where, with a shooting uh, at Building 2. It was a public building. Uh, and in the aftermath of that shooting, crosses were put up by the mourners. Uh, and those crosses were put up under... Uh, their, their feeling of grief, their feeling of sorrow, their feeling of loss. Uh, under Justice Ginsburg interpretation of the Constitution, all of that was improper uh, because you can't put a cross on public land. Uh, I vigorously disagree. Wendy? Amen. Coming up, why this celebrity fitness guru quit Hollywood to become a Kentucky coal miner. We got a call one day from her teacher at school, and she said, well, she's carrying your picture at school every day, all day now. And I said, that's all I need. And <laughs> see how this man's simple plan is helping parents and children around the country. Well, many marriages in America end in divorce, and these breakups can be especially difficult on the children. As Mark Martin shows us, one father is helping divorced couples work together to protect their children. It's safe to say Bill Gobin has experienced extremes in his life. 
After a successful career in sunny L.A. as a personal trainer for actors and professional athletes, he worked in the dark coal mines of Kentucky. Why the change? Elevating being a dad above the spotlight of Hollywood. It was incredible. I mean, I saw the world, went to multiple countries, but as I got more successful, getting home became harder. Since Gobin started, decided to walk away from that life to be an on-the-scene single dad for his oldest daughter. But I got a call one day from her teacher at school, and she said, well, she's carrying your picture at school every day, all day now. And I said, that's all I need. And I talked to her that night, and I said, give me a week and I'll be home. And I was. I came home because, uh, you know, my children are more important than anything to me. Back in Kentucky, Gobin would remarry, and the couple had two daughters. After four years, that relationship ended, and a series of events led him to fight for sole custody of his two youngest daughters. Gobin has made 45 appearances here at the Henderson County Judicial Center in defense of his daughters and fighting to be their sole custodial parent. In fact, he's represented himself 15 of those appearances, winning every time. God knows my heart, he knows my motives for the way I fought for the girls and how much I love the girls. And, and I don't love them more than her mom, I just love them in a different way. She loves them the best that, that she can, but there are things to fix. After one of the court hearings, Gobin says he heard a statement from a lawyer he knew that prompted him to do more. He said, it's not enough. And it just kept, that just hit me. And that kept ringing the term, it's not enough. It's not enough. And I know what he meant was it's not enough to get custody. But I'm like, there's got to be a better way. There's, there's something missing here. The better way for Gobin led him to become an advocate for what's known as co-parenting, where divorced parents work together instead of against each other. Well, for me, co-parenting is 100% when you think about your child before you think about yourself. And sadly, most decisions are ego-driven. His journey also led to the book, If You Can Get Over Yourself, Co-Parenting is Simple. And simple is the acronym for the six chapters in the book. Stop the chaos. It's not about you. Make it your life's mission, because it is. Professional help, get some. Leave your kids out of it and evolve as co-parents. 67 pages to explain common sense. And it is actually simple. And his eight and nine-year-old daughters might be his biggest cheerleaders. So co-parenting is where two people, they're divorced, they, they work it out, they work together, try to create the best life for their children. It's good that parents, that parents should be co-parenting for the kids because I think it helps the kids have like a better relationship whenever their parents are like, you know, broken up. And like, normally whenever people break up, it, it hurts the people in the middle. Gobin's message of co-parenting is also resonating with area leaders. He has posted on his dining room wall different proclamations from mayors proclaiming 2019 Bill Gobin's co-parenting year. And over here, the governor of Kentucky appointed Bill a Kentucky colonel for his child advocacy work. That's the highest honor that a civilian can receive in the Commonwealth. And, you know, me encouraging mayors to, to say, hey, let's make the whole year a co-parenting year, Bill Goldman's co-parenting year. Encourage parents to meet, do something once a month, if it's bowl, if it's, you know, go to an arcade or whatever the case may be, but do something to so, show some unity. And this thing is just, it's just taken off. Now I'll lay me down to sleep for Goldman hopes his legacy is one of helping millions of children. And that's not all. That I took an enormous amount of pain, listened to God, and turned it into something that can prevent millions of tears being shed from unhappiness. And I want my daughters to... <clears throat> Be proud of the dad. Mark Martin, CBN News. I hope you were listening to those children. They were the ones caught in the middle. Uh, in the old line, there's a thin line between love and hate is always played out in divorce courts. I'm always amazed at how, the, how adversarial it becomes where both sides try to prove how right they are and how wrong the other person is. And it turns into these epic battles 
uh, even in states with so-called no-fault divorce, where it becomes a economic transaction, and then uh, you, you look at what's what's the best for the children going forward. Even in those states, you see these epic battles where uh, they're just trying to sling mud at each other, and the only people profiting from it are the lawyers involved. Uh, it'd be wonderful to say in the no-fault cases, well, it's no fault, so no evidence about how bad the other person is. Uh, let's just get on with this and, and get to the real, very real thing of how do you take care of the kids? Uh, and co-parenting, what a wonderful idea to say, okay, instead of us fighting, uh, how can we work together to raise our children? The book is called, If You Can Get Over Yourself, Co-Parenting is Simple. And you can find it wherever books are sold. Wendy? Great story. Well, up next, a young man who was opened up from ear to ear and had part of his tongue removed only to see his cancer return stronger than before. He says, I, I don't know what to tell you, but the cancer came back. It came back more aggressive. It's spreading quicker. It's already spread to your neck. This is borderline stage four cancer. We have to operate. Watch a miracle story that went around the world when we return. Jason David literally Googled easiest ways to die. His body was so racked with cancer, he spent his days writhing in pain. He couldn't eat, he couldn't sleep, but his wife could sing. And so when she started to worship in Jason's hospital room, Jason finally felt peace. And soon he got the strength needed to make an incredible comeback. It was this really exciting moment in my life. We were getting this new job, this new church family, new city. But while this is happening, as I get the new job, my tongue is like swelling. There's this thing on my tongue. Like it was affecting my speech. It was affecting me being able to eat. They do a biopsy and that's when I find out. Two weeks into this new job, this new season of life, uh, you have cancer. And my first response was, that's not my story. I have friends and that's their story. I, I have family members and that was their story. That's, this is not how my story goes. My body like shuts down. All of a sudden, my hip, it feels like my hip is broken. It's in so much pain. The next morning, I'm, I'm trying to take a shower and as I get out of the shower, I, my body just collapsed to the ground and I'm, I'm shaking on the ground and I just start screaming. And, and my wife runs over to see what's wrong, and my body's just convulsing. I don't know how to explain it. Doctors discovered the stage three cancer in Jason's tongue was secreting a chemical that was poisoning him from the inside out. His 13-day hospital stay included a trip to the operating room. So they drill a hole in my hip. Now I'm in a wheelchair with cancer in my mouth. So then they do the first surgery, and they open me up from ear to ear and they begin to remove half of my lymph nodes. And they remove 20% of my tongue, believing that they'll get all the cancer out. It's over. Now, now I'm gonna come, I'm going to that promised land. I'm gonna be the pastor God called me to be. All of a sudden, at the end of June, my tongue, that same thing is on my tongue. I remember the doctor, he looks at it and he says, I, I don't know what to tell you, but the cancer came back. It came back more aggressive. It's spreading quicker. It's already spread to your neck. It didn't spread this fast last time. This is borderline stage four cancer. We have to operate. We're gonna remove most of your tongue. To reconstruct your tongue, we're going to take a chunk of your arm. We're gonna form a tongue in your mouth. Oh, and your leg. We're gonna to have to take the skin from your leg. We're gonna put that on your arm. I'm like, what? Now I'm a piano player. He, so it's like, you're not gonna be able to use your arm for a while. I'm a singer and a speaker. He says, you're not gonna talk the same. He kept talking and I literally stopped listening and I just start crying. I, and I, I felt so unprofessional. I, I didn't feel like an adult, like a man in that moment because I'm just sitting in the chair weeping as the doctor is just telling me what's gonna happen. And I'm like, I, I can't do this. He looked um, just, like he had gotten out of a warfare, like he just was all bandaged up and everything, and he looked like he had taken a pretty hard hit. I'm feeling like I need to throw up, but I can't throw up because my tongue is so 
swollen. I'm laying in the bathroom. I'm laying on the ground, covered in my own waste. And I'm throwing up. I've got mucus pouring out of my neck, blood coming out of my mouth, and I am screaming in pain. All I know is simple math. The pain is too much. The only way to end the pain is to die. I remember typing it in Google. Easy ways to die. Easy ways to die, because I'm tired of the pain. So if I'm gonna kill myself, I don't want it to hurt. He was just in a persistent pain. Usually he can say hi, or usually he can um, smile, but you know he couldn't do any of those things. She begins to do something that she rarely ever does. She begins to sing. She begins to sing over me. I was fighting like the worry, I was fighting the anxiety, I was fighting the fear that, that the, the doctors weren't gonna be right again. But um, I just kept on choosing to just worship God and knowing that um, everything was gonna be okay. And all of a sudden in that moment, I just felt like a, a presence just enter the room. And it was like, it was like if peace was a person, he entered that room in that moment. And I just began to drift off to sleep for the first time in three days. I woke up the next day and I, I started telling myself, I'm not going to give up. It was Easter Sunday. Jason's pastor came to the house beforehand and asked if he was well enough to stand before the church congregation. And I remember as soon as I walked on the stage and Pastor Jeff hadn't warned them that I was coming, I remember the whole place stood to their feet and and I felt what it felt like to be a part of a family who will walk with you through any journey in life, a family that will love you even when you've done nothing for them. After many painful surgeries, the cancer came back. I had to do more surgeries, chemotherapy, radiation, and they told me you might not sing again. You might not even speak again. But I'm here today, I'm standing, I'm walking, I'm jumping. And now I get to sing and speak about the goodness of God. You are greater than these walls I'm circling. You are stronger than this army that I see. You are bigger. After two days, it's got 200,000 views. I'm like, Oh, that's so cool. Wow, like people are being blessed by it. A week later, it hits a million views. And we're kind of just this feeling of like, wait, what's happening? All of a sudden, we have people from Korea who fly to California to visit our church to see what is this, what is happening here. All of a sudden, I got people in Sweden and Australia and the UK who are messaging us and saying, hey, I, I have tongue cancer too. Other people saying, I, I, have, I stopped painting because of my illness. I stopped dancing because of my disease. I stopped singing because the first time I heard myself sing in the shower, I broke down crying because of the tongue cancer. But when I saw your story, I decided I want my own comeback story. I, I don't like the false narrative that everything, you have to look back at your life and be like, oh, it's okay, because it wasn't okay. What happened to Jesus was not okay. Him being nailed to a cross, being tortured was not okay, but it's about Jesus taking the things in your life that are not okay. They represent death and darkness and despair and hopelessness and him saying, watch the ultimate comeback. I can redeem it. I can bring what was dead back to life. And now I look back and I see when it come back. Like he did it and he gets all the glory. And the only thing I can do is never give up. This is my song. This is my dare to worship you, even as these walls are standing there. What a wonderful story. God inhabits the praises of his people. When you start singing praise to him, he comes down and he lives in that. And then here's a vo verse for you. It's from Zephaniah. That's not a book you hear too much about. But in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17, he will join in your song. He will sing over you. 
in Psalm 37, he will sing songs of deliverance over you. He will deliver you. He will heal you. He will restore you. Don't for a minute think it's God's will that you suffer, that you have disease, that you have pain, that you have any of these things. It is not his will. Look to heaven. Now in heaven, is anybody sick? Anybody suffering? Anybody have chronic disease? The answer is no. And we're commanded by Jesus. This is his prayer. Here's how you should pray. Pray that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. So tell your disease, I'm sorry, you're illegal in the kingdom of heaven. You don't have a right to my body. You, 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 it's not my cancer. You're illegal. Leave now in Jesus' name. Command it. Take the authority you have as a believer in Jesus Christ. Sing songs of deliverance over your own body and realize God will inhabit that. He wants to deliver his people. He wants to set you free. Uh, so today, let today be the day where you cross through that Red Sea. And as you're crossing through, you look behind and all the waters are taking all your disease away. All of your enemy, where are they? They aren't in there anymore because God has delivered you. Now, Wendy and I are going to pray. And before we pray with you, here's a verse. I want you to meditate on this. When two or more agree touching anything, it shall be done for them by my Father in heaven. These are the words of Jesus. So you can count on them. So what I want you to do is think about, well, how do I agree touching? And to encourage you, here's some other people that agreed as a result of touching. Here's Lois from Jacksonville, Texas. She was watching the 700 Club. Wendy said, you have terrible back pain. You're asking God for help. Your spine is being healed. Well, Lois called our prayer centers and we're excited to tell us she is completely healed. What do you have? The Lord. For two years, Bobby of Clearwater, Florida suffered from pain in both of her inner ears. She fell five times in six months due to the dizziness. One day she was watching the 700 Club. She heard you give a word of knowledge, Gordon, saying someone has trouble with chronic ear infections. God just healed you. By faith, Bobby placed her hands on both ears, believing God for heal healing and he did. Bobby sat up in bed the next morning, and for the first time in a long time, the dizziness was gone. She got up, felt normal. She's had no trouble since. Okay, what did Bobby do? She placed her hands on that area that needed healing. And by his stripes, you are healed. So Wendy and I are going to agree with you. All you need to do is touch and realize that the eyes of the Lord are going to and fro over the whole world to show himself strong for you because you're demonstrating your faith. Well, let's believe and let God do all the rest. Amen. Lord, we lift those who have chronic illnesses. We lift those with cancer. We lift those with any kind of spinal cord injury. We lift those with chronic back pain, mm -hmm. recurring infections, recurring sinus, ear infections, uh, rec recurring fungal infections. What, whatever the issue is, Lord God, we just lift it to you. And we declare over them, the kingdom of God has come to you. And in his dominion, all disease leaves. When his will is being done, it is being done perfectly. So pain infirmity, disease, leave now. And we rejoice, Lord God. We rejoice over your sacrifice. We rejoice at what you have done. We rejoice that by your stripes we are healed. We receive your sacrifice. We take it into our bodies now. And we say, disease, leave and return no more. For by his stripes, I am healed now in Jesus' name. When did God just gave you something? There's someone in you, you're sick in your body because of a root of bitterness. When you forgive, God is saying that spirit of infirmity will leave and you are going to be healed in Jesus' name. 
someone you've got a chronic bone infection in your um, teeth and it's causing your teeth to loosen, you've even lost some, God is able to heal that infection. He's able to restore bone. He's able to restore your smile. So just rejoice right now and realize God has just healed you of that. He's able to regrow bone where there is no bone. He's able to reattach teeth. And in Jesus' name, be, be restored and be made whole. There's someone you have a uh, problem with uh, TMJ in your right jaw. God has just healed that. Someone else with problems in your right elbow with floating chips that cause recurring pain every time you move. In Jesus' name, be healed. Someone else, you have tendons out of place in your left knee, and God is putting them back into place, taking all that swelling, all that pain, all that discomfort away from you right now. In Jesus' name, be healed, be made whole. Someone else with problems with your right kidney and uh, extraordinary pain, infection, kidney stones. God is healing all of it right now. Yes. In Jesus' name, receive it. Wendy? Yes, uh, someone with that. You have chronic bladder infections, UTIs. God is healing you right now. You're not going to suffer with that anymore. And there's also someone with diabetes symptoms. Um, but guys, we're going to reverse those. You are not going to be a diabetic. God is healing you. And as you as you do what the doctor says, you will be healed in Jesus' name. Someone you were involved in a motorcycle accident and you twisted your back very badly and you've got lingering numb, numbness, ting, tingling, uh, inability to use your right leg. God is healing you. He's able to restore nerves. He's able to regrow things. And in Jesus' name, be restored, be made whole. All that muscle weakness, we speak strength to the muscle, we speak strength to the leg. Be restored now in Jesus' name. Lord God Almighty, we thank you. We thank you for all that you have done for us. Your love for us is everlasting and it's new every morning. We praise you for it. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you have been healed, let us know. Call us 1-800-700-7000. And we believe in prevailing prayer. That's the prayer that gets an answer. So if you need prayer, we're here for you 24 hours a day. If you want someone to agree with you touching anything, just call us 1-800-700-7000. Wendy? And that amazing story we just saw, we want to thank our friends at Benita Valley Community Church in Benita Valley, California, for sharing Pastor Jason David's story with us. With us. Incredible miracle. Well, up next, a five-week pilgrimage and a 40-year friendship. And I just said, hey, do you want to go across 500 miles in northern Spain with me? And his answer was, yeah, I'll push you. It was just one more opportunity to build more memories. Watch these fast friends relive their incredible journey right after this. And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. Regulations to stop clinics from receiving federal funding if they share office space with abortion providers stays in place for now. The Ninth Circuit Federal Court of Appeals made the decision over the Trump administration rules while it considers multiple lawsuits. Although this could be temporary, pro-life groups say it is a victory. The Alliance Defending Freedom calling it, quote, another step forward ensuring greater government program integrity and the protection of every human life, no matter how vulnerable. Operation Blessing is providing critical medical care to families in need in Iquitos, Peru. Belin is one of the poorest districts in that city. Families suffer in extreme poverty and battle diseases because of lack of access to medical care. Thanks to Operation Blessing, teams are providing medical care at a centrally located site. They helped this man whose name is Hernan. He was hit by a motorcycle and couldn't walk, so as you saw, Operation Blessing traveled to him and physically carried him to the clinic for treatment. You can learn more about what Operation Blessing is doing around the world by visiting ob.org. Gordon and Wendy are back with more of today's 700 Club. It's coming up right after this.
When a woman from India became a Christian, she was shunned by her neighbors and in-laws. But that never deterred her from worshiping Jesus. And she never stopped praying that he would send her family a clean source of water near their home. Then one day, her prayers were answered and the lives of everyone in her village were totally transformed. Every day, Pushpa took her rope and her copper pot and walked miles to fetch water. Rajasthan is a desert area, and it is very hot in the summer. In the most extreme heat, we need more water. So in one day, we make several trips through the hills to get water. We get so tired, our feet hurt, and our heads ache from dehydration. The water source wasn't just far away. The water from the open pit was filthy. My children were always getting sick. I felt like our lives would never change or improve. We would just continue to suffer like our ancestors. Then Pushpa heard about Jesus from a relative. I visited her home church a few times with my husband, but when our neighbors found out about that, they got angry with us. When we became Christians, my in-laws ostracized us, and we felt like we were alone. I told people, I will survive alone in the jungle, but I will not leave my Lord. This went on for years. All that time, I prayed to Jesus for clean water closer to my home. When the pastor contacted CBN, we sent a team to dig a well in the village. Soon, everyone had access to clean water. I was overjoyed. The water is now really close to my house and we are really happy. We do not have to suffer or get sick anymore. Since then, many people in the village have given their lives to Christ. They saw our faith in action. People who once opposed us for our faith are now believers. They have seen the power of God. They have seen the power of God. Isn't that amazing? Well, if you're a CBN partner, you're, you were there. You helped bring clean drinking water to that village and the gospel. If you'd like to be a part of helping people all over the world and right here at home, it's so easy. We invite you to go to your phones right now. The number's on your screen, 1-800-700-7000, or you can log on to CBN.com. And join the 700 Club. It's just 65 cents a day. $20 a month is all it takes to be a CBM partner and to help so many people. We want to bless you when you do that with Pat's new teaching called The Plan, Eight Ways, Eight Keys to Understanding God's Will for Your Life. This is a dynamic teaching that will bless you. And if you call right now, we're going to send it to you. So please do that. Well, up next, a 500-mile journey that forged a friendship and strengthened their faith. We didn't think about the challenge, we had no idea how difficult it was going to be. <laughs> it was just, okay, the decision's been made. It's important to him, so it's important to me. We'll figure it out. See how their pilgrimage inspired others to chase their dreams. Next. Justin and Patrick have been friends for 40 years, so when Justin decided he wanted to complete a 500-mile hike, Patrick was eager to go, and instantly he said, I'll push you. If you have those moments in your life where you just know inside and out, it's something you're supposed to do. I just knew, I just knew. For Justin Skisuck, it would be the epic adventure he and lifelong friend Patrick Ray had talked about for years. A 500-mile trek on the legendary El Camino de Santiago. For centuries, people have been making the pilgrimage that traces the steps of James the Apostle, from the foot of the French Pyrenees to the Santiago de Compostela Cathedral on the west coast of Spain. Every year, roughly 250,000 hike the trail, but very few do it in a wheelchair. I just said, hey, do you want to go across 500 miles in northern Spain with me? And his answer was, yeah, I'll push you. I didn't have any other thought than, yeah, I'll push you, because we've, we've just shared so much of life together, and it was just one more opportunity to build more memories. It's a friendship that started 40 years ago. Together, they have supported one another through tournaments, graduations, milestones, and even disease. In 2004, Justin was diagnosed with multifocal acquired motor axonopathy, an autoimmune disease that has slowly robbed him 
of all of his motor skills and will eventually take his life. It has left him completely dependent on his wife, Kirsten, for daily care. But Patrick didn't give it a second thought. We didn't think about the challenge. We had no idea how difficult it was going to be. <laughs> it was just, OK, the decision's been made. It's important to him, so it's important to me. We'll figure it out. The hike is a five-week trek that traverses mountains, rivers, and desert. Training and preparing for the trip would take two years. Overcoming the doubt that crept in every now and then took prayer. Pat would be completely freaked out. I would be more calm and just kind of like, okay, we're going to get through this. And then, you know, I would be then freaked out and then he would be calm. As well. Luckily, we were never in the same cycle together. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like we were on yeah. like two hamsters on wheels, but they were going at different paces. So we yeah. Had different points at different points in time. But we had never, we never prayed so hard, I think, ever, no. ever um, together. Then in June of 2014, they said goodbye to their families in Boise, Idaho and boarded their flight to Paris, France. With them was a film crew documenting their journey to raise awareness for Justin's disease. Two days later, as they made their way up the Pyrenees Mountains, reality set in. The trail consistently pitches one way or the other. And so we're always on a little bit of an angle to the right or the left. And so Justin's constantly having to move back and forth to shift his weight while communicating to me what he's going to see coming up. Come on. Come on. We had some very steep declines, and we had safety harnesses attached to me, and they'd have to, two or three people would have to get behind Patrick. Stop. Stop, Pat. Pat, stop. I'm stopped. Okay, back, back up. Back, okay. Okay. I'm tilted. My wheelchair weighs about 250 pounds yeah. with me in it and the weight of gear and in the chair itself and whatnot, so it's quite it's quite heavy. It'll pull you straight down straight down a hill, and it's very slow moving going up. One, two, three. This way. There were moments where we literally thought this might be it for the day. Like, I, like we're done. Mechanical malfunction. Oh, oh gosh. It's hard not to feel like a burden in this. Got it. Oh, I'm cramping. I don't know how much time he has, you know. It's really hard to let somebody do that for you. But as only good friends can, they kept each other going. Yo, what's up, bro? <laughs> <laughs> the dynamics that we just kind of just embrace vulnerability, accountability, really being honest with each other, kind of unabashed honesty about where we're at, what we feel. Um, if we don't agree with something, just throwing it all out there and being okay, A, saying it, and B, being okay, receiving it, has just created this, this dynamic that exists where there's no fear. There's no fear within our relationship. And that, I think, is, is where God has really been able to mold us into kind of a one unit. We both took our expectations off the table, and however that played out is however it played out. And if he just needed a listening ear, it was listening ear. If he needs somebody to laugh with, somebody to laugh with. If he needs somebody to cry with, he needs somebody to cry with. I just wanted to be there for him. Okay, seriously, dude, it's time to walk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just faking it, guys. <laughs> but their honesty and trust wasn't the only thing that got them through the journey. God was with us every step of the way. There we Burn go. Someone will show up out of nowhere. <laughs> High five. <laughs> you have those, you, know, you call them angels, and whether they're angels or not, you know, I don't know, but they're, they're people that God's using. We met people from 27 countries. We had over 100 people help us. So I think about that, at least 100 moments or periods of time where people were placed in our path for a reason. With God and the help of complete strangers, Justin and Patrick finished their pilgrimage in 35 days. Looking back, they have come to appreciate their friendship even more. For them, it's not about sacrifice or humility. It's about love. This whole journey has revealed to me the, the truth that we are so much better together than we are alone. We're meant to live life together 
And that's where God calls us to be. It's way more exciting, way more fun, pushes you in ways you never thought you could go or who you could be as a person. So often the beauty that, that God wants us to see is within one another. The opportunity for provision is in one another. The opportunity for experiencing God's love is through the love he's pouring into our wife or our husband or our children. It's community, it's embracing others and loving them in a, just a recklessly, you know, passionate way. Since returning from Spain, Justin and Patrick founded Push Inc., an organization that helps groups and individuals achieve their dreams. Together, the two have co-written their first book, inspired audiences as motivational speakers, and are the subjects of a documentary film covering their journey of friendship called I'll Push You. You can see God at work. You can. You can see God at work right in front of us. When you ask God to take control of your life, <laughs> hold on, because you're in for a wild ride. Wow, what a journey. Justin and Patrick's book about their journey is called I'll Push You, and it's available wherever books are sold. You can also learn more about their nonprofit foundation by going to CBN.com. Incredible story, Gordon. Yeah, and what a brilliant il illustration of the gospel where God literally pushes us. He takes us. Jesus said this, and then he said it on the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, when, when you get into that, it's the poor, or literally the Greek word is those who are physically unable to work. And he says you're blessed. When you realize you're physically unable to get any blessings from him at all, well, that's the point in time where you can receive. Here are words from Philippians chapter 4. And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. For Wendy, for me, for all of us here, God bless you, and may you have a wonderful weekend.